Uncool is recorded on Audio Technica mics. We're back again with more uncool where it's cool to be uncool. What are your rates? How much do you earn? How much do you spend? We don't talk about this enough, right? So this season, Sean, what are we going to be talking about? Well, we are going to speak to our guests about really what's their psychology of money. We ask them what, you know, if they can share with other freelancers as well. Uh, Most importantly, what are the lessons they have on wealth, greed and happiness? And today we have a, of course, as usual, we have a freelancer with us. uh, And I think he's the best person to introduce himself. So, Edward, who are you? Hi, thanks for having me on, Yenling and Sean. My name is Edward Choi. I'm an actor. I'm a host. I lecture part-time at NUS. I do quite a bit of financial literacy education for freelancers and young people. And yes, I have voiced over 700 ads that this traffic report is brought to you by Harvey Norman. Yes. Oh my goodness. (laughs) Oh, wait. (laughs) You know, if you listen to that voice, Jim, in telling you there's a sale, he tells you there's a, you go on a cruise. I'm sorry for the spam, folks. That's my, that's my one party trick. People are like, so, so what do you do? Then I tell them that and they're just like, Holy <laughs> it, It's like if you walk into he can walk into any company right, and he'll be like, Hey, you know what? I'm the guy on your voice now and I'm I'm voicing your company right no now. La. I'm jumping the queue. <laughs> I'm jumping the queue. No, no. It, it's it I, I, I wish I, that I, were the I, case, I want, but I want no. that <laughs> Oh man, you could walk right to the front of the queue of the Swatch Omega the line. Dream, you know, but no, it doesn't happen. <laughs> Back to the point. What is your psychology of money, and what uh, can what are the important lessons you have for us on uh, wealth, greed, and happiness? Wow, psychology of money. Um, this is a big question, Sean. And I think, as someone who's in a society that's very sensitive to money, we we live in a capitalist society. We're very sensitive to material things, how much they cost. So, our thoughts, our lives are sort of. Sh- structured specifically around how to have enough money to have what we want now and to get more money to get what we want in future. So my psychology of money actually is quite straightforward. I want to reach a point where I have enough to do whatever the heck I want for whomever the heck I want. And that's it. Whether it means work or whether it means to give away money to help people with things, yeah. Yeah, that has always been my goal, right? It just sounds so nice, but then once you actually try and do it, and then you realise, okay... Yeah, it's a lot of work. <laughs> when exactly are you going to start to do it? Like, when are you going to get there to know that you can do it? Because I think one of the psychologies of money that we can kind of agree, whether you have a lot or you have very little, is that it's very, it's very often never enough. When you have enough... Uh, well, in this case, we are talking money. So when you have enough money, then you realize that it's not fun anymore, right? And happiness is just always expectations. I want more, I want more. This idea of contentment and satiety with regards to wanting money is actually very important. And there's this wonderful uh, non-scientific theory called Parkinson's Law, which is that the amount of demand will always expand to the amount of supply. So what does that mean? That means that your teacher gives you a week to finish your homework, you take a week. Your teacher gives you three days, you take three days. Your teacher wants it tomorrow, you get it done tomorrow. So same thing with money, which is why a lot of people, they're always just like, okay, when I get a promotion, I'll be able to start saving. When I get that bonus, I'll be able to start investing. They can't because their spending goes up with their income. It's fascinating, but that is basic human psychology. This has been true forever. It's incredible that humans are just so damn predictable. Is that something that you have to very, very consciously and very actively try and avoid? When I discovered that, the first thing that really worked for me, and I did a lot of research on this because, yeah, I went through a really rough rough patch in my life, um, was that in order not to spend money, you must do this sort of life hack or brain hack to trick yourself into thinking you don't have the money. And the best way to do that is to hide the money from yourself. If you can't see the money, you won't spend it. It's it's as simple as that. If I have $10,000 in my bank account, I feel rich. But if I only have $1,000 in my bank account, I feel like, whoa, 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 dial it back there, bro. (laughs) Maybe take the bus. Actually, that's the simplest thing, right? I think a lot of people, I've spoken to some friends as well, 
And I think they have that same issue. That's why they have multiple bank accounts or at least having an investment account, a savings account, um, even if they have to talk to their uh, financial advisor and say, can you please take, take this whole lump sum of money away from me? At least it's smarter than leaving it in their own, uh, especially if there is an ATM card attached to that account. Yeah, yeah I often tell the story about uh, credit cards and how incredibly psychologically terrifying it can be. Uh, when I first graduated, one of my classmates, okay, early 20s, uh, his starting salary was about 4K. They gave him a credit card with a credit limit of over $30,000. And after his first couple of months, he, w- he had spent about, if I'm not wrong, he was in debt for over $25,000. So uh, keep this in mind, dude only earns 4K a month, okay? No savings already has charged 25k to the card. Credit cards, if you don't already know, folks, you know it now. Credit cards have an annual interest rate of 25.9% per annum. 25.9%! It's quite sickening. Okay, it's insane. So you don't pay your debt because it rolls at that amount. So eventually, I think he had to do a balance transfer and... Yeah, it's it's dangerous. The more you can spend, the more you will spend. So for me, it's been very important finding ways and my, my best way is investing. I put in stocks. I don't ever want to sell them. I put in crypto. I don't ever want to sell them. I can't touch it. So it's too bad. It's gone. But Can't yeah, spend it. But so needless to say, you're not, you're, not, you're not a fan of leverage, clearly. Oh no, I've been burnt. <laughs> very hard by leverage. Very, very hard. So I it leverage basically for those of you who are who are just like, what is leverage? Is, is that the thing when you take a stick and then try to push something up? It's in financial terms, it's when you borrow money to try to make money. Okay. It's dangerous. If you don't know what you're doing, you borrow money, you try to make money. If whatever you invested in starts to fall, you dead. You so dead. <laughs> Yeah, right? Because it was not your money to begin with and now you owe more than you previously did. So I actually don't. That's it. I do have multiple income streams with regards to being a freelancer. I take on jobs doing, as I said, I'm a multi-hyphenate by necessity. (laughs) No choice. (laughs) Otherwise, cannot live. Right? So I I do all the things that I can do, I'm good at, I'm happy doing. It's awesome. And then I have my investments, which offer me a steady stream of income with regards to dividends, but also with the certainty, at least personally, I believe there's certainty, that I have some money in future for my retirement. That's in future. Yeah. And that's it. That that really is it. it. Yeah. So you can't spend all of it. It's like CPF, right, for yourself. Yeah. Uh, because freelancers, you can contribute to CPF. I think it's a great thing. Um, but we don't. We usually just don't. On that topic, yeah, right. So what, what is your philosophy when it comes to CPF and having it, you know, depositing something every month? Because I know we've spoken to quite a few, a number of people, of course, depending on the age range and depending on their life goals. <laughs> you know, they have... They have different views on it. Some of them are very practical. I want to buy a house and that's why I'm putting it in. Some of them are really against it and um, just like why I want to keep I want to keep my money on hand, right? Um, I want to keep my cash flow visible and then the rest of them are just a bit on the fence, I would say. What's your take? You guys heard of this thing called inflation, right? And this is a real thing. Uh, as governments print more money, your money is worth less. That it's... It's, it's simple math. That's it. There's more of it, so the value of it goes down. So the value of your money is constantly going down. The amount of things you can buy with your money is constantly going down. This is why you need to invest or have someone willing to pay you a higher salary that beats inflation. <laughs> so which one is easier? You tell me, la, okay? You talk to your boss. And, and, and of course, there is the third way. The third way, of course, is the truly, truly, the, the way which I truly respect, I have no talent for it, which is to be an entrepreneur, to start your own business and to take on the risks of that. And to be an entrepreneur is to go all in, okay? You invest in what? You invest in your belief in yourself and your ideas. And that's the biggest investment you can ever make. But you are still investing. When you choose not to invest, you are saying, I give up to capitalism, to the stock markets, to the banks, and you say, take it. Okay, take my money. I'm too scared to do anything. And people don't realize that. I'm too scared. Yeah, you lose. I'm sorry. That's that's just how the game works. When did you 
like come to this realization i would guess um and then when did you start investing because i don't know whether it was natural but for me for for example and uh, for a lot of people um in the creative field in my in my clique at least is something just anything with numbers in general we avoid <laughs> i am with you that's so, so it, bad with numbers <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, bad. So when when did that change? When did that like? When did you feel like okay, I gotta do something, uh, or was there even that point, or was it just like you know, just try a little bit, try a little bit. So I finished. Goes. So I, I took all the time in the world to finish school. Okay, I did. I, I did my masters, and I took the maximum amount of time available to do it because don't want to start working. Then when I had to start working, I started getting greedy. But it also so that's why I became a banker. I was a banker for a very short amount of time, but it was in that time that I realized I started learning these concepts. What I just said about inflation, about the possibilities of investing, why compound interest is so important, and how that's going to change your life. So that was the first step. Unfortunately, my next step was to gamble away all my money, which was not the right thing to do because I wanted to be rich. So greed followed. So I tried to skip the working. Um, thank God. I, I think what I've realized since is that actually investing and saving prudently and aggressively can be very satisfying on a sort of mental health standpoint because you, if you... Where you know, see the growth, is it? <laughs> yeah, you, if you know you don't have to worry about the future, about tomorrow about putting food on the table, about paying your bills. Hey, that's a lot of stress off, off the table straight away. You can go worry about the more important things, your family, your loved ones, your work, your dreams. Go worry about those. Why worry about money? Please don't. Okay, spend, spend your time worrying about things that matter. You shared like a huge load of transitions that you went through after you graduated. What did you study, by the way? Uh, I, well, master, what did you study I have a master's in theatre. So I'm a theatre major. I'm a theatre academic. I, I teach part-time at the university acting theory. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's so what wait, I study. How do you go into banking? My ex at the time, who was incredibly successful, she was in banking. She was making a crap ton of money. And I thought, you know, I'd like to get in on some of that. And it was a mistake, of course, because it wasn't for me. But it was also a mistake, on, on the other hand, because I was... You know how they say a little knowledge is a dangerous thing? Everybody else uh, in my cohort in, in the bank, when they went to training could skip the, some of the exams, could skip some of the classes. I had to take nine exams in one month, Ken. Because zero finance background. <gasps> in one month? It, it was insane. Oh, and then the I rest am, of them came from the finance. They have business uh, degrees, degrees. They have stuff. econs degrees. Oh. So they, they could skip a lot of these things because they studied it already. I had to take these exams and it was no joke, I can tell you. <laughs> okay? I am bad with numbers. I am still bad with numbers. It is... No fun. Like, Sean could ask me, like, have you looked at the P ratio of this thing? And I'm like, okay, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> What's a P ratio? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Price to earnings. <laughs> like, okay, okay. Then compared to the PB, uh, okay, right? Let's try to find something. Mm, no, no, not, not, not. So I'm a fundamental analysis kind of guy, not technical analysis. I'm, I'm really just, and even in my FA, it's more of like general geopolitical macroeconomics rather than the nitty gritties of the, okay, look at this percent, look at this percent. What can we, con you know, what, what, what can we conclude from this? And I'll be like, number go up. Like everything <laughs> just flew through my head, basically. <laughs> just flew over my head. Having, having said that, you are quite successful in what you are doing in terms of your, your, your stock picks and so on. So, ish. Yeah, I think you're doing something correct. I I think you're doing something correct. Eh? The correct thing to do, Sean, and this is completely honest, would have been not to touch anything in my stock portfolio from when I was at the bank and just leave it alone and keep buying the same stocks. But what I did instead was try to beat the market, which is the wrong things. Lah. So this year I went through, I, I had a bit of an epiphany and I told myself, you got to Marie Kondo this crap. I had Almost 30 US counters. Huh? Okay, just US alone. Don't say Singapore. Don't say Hong Kong. I have 30. That's so, way too many stocks. So this year, I, I just like, okay, you have 10. You get 10. At, and yeah, I, I've managed to cut it down to 13. So oh, wait, it's not bad. It's isn't, not bad. isn't more better? Sorry, I'm, I, you see, this is well, how much I, I invest. I think, like. I, I think that, that there's a couple of, of, of thinking here. I mean, the more the better because you're thinking of diversification, right? You want to be in different sectors and so on, uh, which is not, a, not necessarily wrong. But then again, you, get, you just get very confused. Yeah, it, it really was. And I've been very grateful that I've been watching 
so this particular YouTuber that I watch called uh, is Invest Answers. This guy called James runs it, and he often talks about how he only focuses on the winners because most forty percent of the returns of the S and P five hundred come from his top six stocks. It's five hundred stocks on that index. Top six generates 40% of his returns. So does it make sense to buy all 500? Does it make sense to buy the index uh, as per no, Warren it's, Buffett? it's logically not possible. Uh, no, Warren Buffett says buy, it's just logically buy not the low-cost ETF, right? Buy the SPY, buy the VOO, buy the IVV. Oh, of course, yeah, of course. Yeah, you can do course. that. But then this guy, he says, why not just buy the top stocks and only buy the top stocks? And you take it to extreme, you have Bill Miller, who's a Wall Street legend, right? He owns two things. He owns half of his portfolio in Amazon, the other half in Bitcoin. That's it. This guy's a legend, okay? And he's like high conviction. So I'm not that brave. But yes, it's important to diversify. But if you don't know what you're doing as you're diversifying, if you're not making sure that the correlations, that they're not closely correlated, you know, you, you, you're not doing it properly. And if you're not a finance professional, you probably don't know how to do it. I, I thought I, I knew, I really didn't. Uh, you're actually much better off just buying a damn index fund. Sort buy of as like, many total you know, tickets as possible. Themselves. I hope just one good trying to act. That's a, all the rational out. thinking is that let, let's diversify and into many sectors. kind of makes sense that like, if one sector goes down, something has to go up. Right? It's like a bit of a seesaw thing. But then again, it's, it's not... I guess it's about being reasonable as well. And what do you, <laughs> you want know, out of life, of money, right, Sean? Of your, yeah, what do you yeah. want out of yeah. investing? Do you, do you want to be one of those hardcore, you know, I want to be pro traders who sit there in front of two screens and like, yeah, trading 24-7? Or do you want to just forget about it and then go on with your life, right? And mm, I think most of us want to be in yeah. that latter category. We don't, we don't need to or want to think about money all the time. It's not fun it really isn't fun so some people choose to uh, delegate that by paying a financial advisor for example okay which is one of the worst things you could do because uh, let's be fair i used to be a banker the banks will always tell you that they have your best interest in mind okay but that's not you know rationally that's not possible why because the bank is a for-profit institution so cannot be possible. So what happens then? The actual, the reality is that the bank has their best interests in mind with your money. So what happens to your money? Where does your money go? I'll give you the best example of this. I used to sell this product that I would give my clients 8% per annum yield. Per annum, not, not on the actual investment, not simply simple interest. This is per annum. So Investment is very short term, two weeks to six weeks. Okay, give them eight percent per annum. What the damn happies, yeah? They'll be like, whoa, then what? Uh, two weeks, eight percent. Why not? You know how much I'm getting? The actual thing generates about twenty five percent interest. I take the other seventeen percent, and I share that with the bank. The bank takes about if I'm not wrong, thirteen to fourteen percent of it, and gives me like the, the other two to three percent. And that's how little bankers. Yeah, but, but, earn. but it sounds like a actually out of it. But it sounds like win-win for everybody, eh? it, but in this, but using what you just said, it's almost a win-win. I mean, like, the bank gets seventeen, you you get some, the guy the guys get eight, okay. and what? So, work with me here, folks. If something has a twenty-five percent per annum return yield, what do you think the risk on that is? This is garbage. Okay, the yield, the yield. If the yield is at twenty-five percent, the risk we are exposing our clients to is nonsensical, and we package it and portray it as being very normal, very ordinary, something they can keep doing. It's part of the reason why I left the banking industry. Uh, there are a lot of bankers out there that I know who are very ethical. They try their best to take care of their customers. You know, they, they don't do this 25% crap. They might do a 10% and then give the customer five and they take, they take five. Good for them. Okay, it's actually very hard to meet your targets that way. This, this sort of hypocrisy was part of the reason why I was... I looked at myself in the mirror one day and I was just like, what are you doing? As I was brushing my teeth, I'm like, you know, I can't stay in this industry anymore. In a sense, th that is also how, how a bit of a psychology about money and luck and risk is kind of like affects everything, right? When the market is a bull market uh, and everybody's making money, uh, the risk tolerance of the average investor goes crazy. Your auntie, uncle starts thinking that everything will make money. And that's when the most predatory practices come out. Conversely, when the market is bearish, 
nobody dares to do anything. And that's the point when I quit because I remember there was a fire sale. This one, I will never forget. There was a fire sale. Okay, hedge fund had to sell the a- bonds. At the bank? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is when, over a decade ago when, when I was about to quit. The banks were forcing the hedge funds to margin call. So they sold this bond on the atrium, you know, next to Plasing. So the bond is secured yeah, on that, that atrium, the Plasing atrium, that building. Wait, next, next to Plasing. Ah, 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 ah yes, the yes, shorter yes, building. Yes, yes. Yeah, ah, yeah. Okay. We, okay. Yeah, we're talking real estate. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. the bond okay. is secured against that. It's a bond. Okay. The only way you can afford it is if you're an accredited investor, you're willing to, each bond costs 250k. But here's the catch. Because it was a fire sale, they only cost 220k. And the coupon on it meant that you'll be getting 270k and maturity in two years' time. So in two years, you're going to get 50k. So, okay, it, this is Lehman crisis. Yeah, huh? people's, yeah that, that, that's the maths. Yeah. And I was just like, it's backed by what? It's backed by the atrium. So there's a building. Who owns the building? Capital Land. Pao Jia. And I called as many of my clients who could afford it as I could. And only 10% of it of them took it up. And I was so sad. And I, I felt like a failure. I felt like I failed them because finally I found something that was definitely going to make money for them. And they were too scared to do anything. Because they were like, no, no, no such thing as Pao Tiawan. No, no, no such thing as safe. Huh? What if Capital Land goes down? They're still around today. <laughs> That's the thing. People stop being rational when they're afraid. So you're saying... You are saying that you should start making, I mean, when there's blood on the streets, that's like the time you should start moving in and doing things. And doing things. So it was at a time where you were um, a banker. Yeah, it you was. You were selling all these stocks and it was basically very, very bad stocks, right? Uh, um, and you were... There, there were investment was it instruments like, that were not stocks that the banks came up with themselves oh, okay. that were very predatory. And when I finally found something that wasn't predatory, yeah, people banker, didn't want to take it but, up. Yeah. Okay. So it was like you mentioned, basically you're selling a bad product at first, right? Because as your as as your job as a banker, at that point of time you were just selling and selling. And then it, it just drained your ethical. And <laughs> sense also at I didn't that know point better. of time. But at that point My God, bankers are so young. They are so incredibly that is true. young. They don't know better. Like yourself like that. <laughs> like, so I, you're I'm basically like selling like, oh. what your boss tells you to sell and then, okay, sell, sell, sell and then people lose money and you're like, oh, I cannot do anything. But then when you actually want to help them, like you mentioned, they're just too scared to do anything at that point of time. So was that your was that your breaking point where you realised that's where I cannot do it anymore? Uh, there was also this was horrible it? moment where there was a quarterly meeting with all the bankers. We go into this big auditorium with the big boss and then uh, they give out awards and I had one for best customer service for that quarter. So in the whole bank, uh, best customer service. Uh, I had the best rating. That's great, right? Because uh, I love, I really love my customers. I, I really like making people happy and making sure that, you know, they, they, they were treated right. I got $20 Taka voucher. $20. <laughs> All right, good, good job, man. But I think <laughs> what, what I want to say to that. <laughs> but, but I think like, how to stay in this kind of job, guys? How how? That's why I left, lah. And I was like, thank God, and, and I'm really grateful for this. Like, hallelujah, I left, and Jesus led me into the land of plenty, which is back back into what I love doing, which is acting and performing. So thank God for that, really. So I guess it's now you have the ability. So from that experience, of course, you probably and of course now I I guess the big difference that you have the. The, the, the freedom, the ability to do what you want, when you want, and for as long as I you mean, want. I mean, I'm hoping I can do that by the time I'm 60. Let's be fair. Okay, I, we, right now, it's still hustling for the next decade and a half, two decades. Yeah. So if you don't mind sharing with us right now, okay, it's a very different situation now where you are right now as compared to back then, right? Oh, you also mentioned that after you you left your banking job, you unfortunately picked up a little bit of some bad habits. Okay, so folks, uh, derivatives, not actual stocks. These are things that uh, whose value are based on the value of the stocks, but not the stocks themselves. So they're, they can move much faster. These are things like options, warrants. So all these things, okay, stock go up, call options and call warrants, 
go up a lot more. How much more? Can be 10 times, can be 100 times. Okay, depending on the risk. I was doing warrants and I discovered it and it, would be, it was ridiculous. I, I was teaching at NUS and I'd be teaching like a three-hour class. I'd finish and I'd be $6,000 up. I thought I was a baller, okay? But can you imagine the sort of risks I was taking? I was basically playing this rather scrappy game of big, small on the stock market. It's either go up or go down. Uh, and every time it went up, yes, I earned a lot. But folks, I lost my entire life savings and my inheritance in the space of two and a half years. Everything, uh, everything was gone. Like I was down to, this is a true story. I'm not bragging. This is how bad it was. I was down to my last 40 bucks in my savings account. And I genuinely, I stood at the balcony, not, not really the balcony, the balcony window. And I, I, I really thought, you know, I'm newly married. I wanted my wife to be happy. I wanted my parents to live in luxury. And I was, I had 40 bucks left and I wanted to jump out the window and thank God I didn't. But I really did. It, it was a bad time. Now looking back, the, the amount is just like, huh? You want to jump over that small amount? You know, but at that time, it was a lot of money. It was all my money. It was all gone. And it took me seven years of saving and investing aggressively. I, I save, I aim to save 50 to 60% of my income every month, sometimes more. And I've been consistently doing that since that horrible episode. And yeah, it took me about seven years to get back the amount. And it's been a couple of years since I made it back and I've more than doubled it. So thank God, you know, it really wow. makes a difference when you save and when you invest prudently rather than trying to do all these like short term trades and then trying to, I, I can't, every time I trade, I lose money. Every time. We'll catch the next episode to find out how Edward made back all that money and then more. He says he's doubled it. So, okay, we need to fight. We need to break that down. Took him seven years, but how did he do that? So, we'll find that out on our next episode. We'll catch you. Drop us a like. Remember to click follow on our podcast. Tell your friends about us. Drop us a five star rating, you know. No worries. It's cool to do that because it's cool to be uncool. Uncool was recorded on Audio Technica mics. <laughs>